Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that we learn about David and how he killed Goliath by trusting in you, even though he was just a boy or a youth facing this giant. And we know, Lord, it was you that did the work. You succeeded through David. We pray now that as we come to your word and uh, the teachings through the Apostle Paul, that you will help us to understand by your Spirit's work in our lives, that you will speak to us from your word, Lord, not through the speaker, but from your word. Guide our lives. Lead us into this new year, we pray, as you've promised to go before, to give us an open door that no man can shut. We look to you, Lord, now to speak from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. <laughs> now I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 1 to 11. <clears throat> it's doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it's not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast. Yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I forbear, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he might depart, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast of my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have become a fool in boasting. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles, though I am nothing. Paul says here, most gladly, I would rather boast in my weaknesses or in my infirmities. And then he says, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I wonder how you feel at the start of 2022. Do you feel weak? You feel sidelined <clears throat> without any real usefulness? Do you feel insignificant? Then let me tell you, if you feel like that, you're in a better position with God at the start of 2022 than if you felt self-confident, well-trained, feeling on top of the world and raring to go. You're in a place where God can do something special if you feel like a weak nobody. I wonder if you've ever wondered what the Apostle Paul may have looked like in his physical presence. 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, just before our reading here, <clears throat> he confesses what people are saying about him. They were saying that his letters were weighty and powerful. This is 2 Corinthians 10. But his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. We also know that he had poor eyesight and his body was covered with scars from his frequent lashings and beatings because of Christ. Other than these descriptions in the Bible, there's one other description that's come down to us from early times of the Apostle Paul. It's in the Apocrypha, those books that were rejected as being part of the Word of God, but still having true historical content, some of them. And in this Acts of Paul and Thecla, we read this. One called Onesiphorus sees Paul as, quote, a man of small stature. That's why he got his name Paul. Paul means little. With a bald head and crooked legs. And most translators think that means bow legs. In a good state of body, so he wasn't skinny, he was meaty. With eyebrows meeting across the top of his forehead. That's significant, I think, in some parts of the world. And a nose somewhat hooked. Full of friendliness. For now he appeared like a man, and now he had the face of an angel. In the Latin version of the Acts of Paul and Thecla, it's added that he had a red, florid face. So he wasn't a very attractive man to look at. He wasn't built like a Samson or like King Saul, who was the source of his name, Paul's original name. The original King Saul was described in the Bible as head and shoulders above all his fellows, a handsome man, more handsome than any other man in Israel. So our Saul later called Paul, meaning little. He was no King Saul. And he was no Cary Grant or Rock Hudson. Do you remember these guys from way back? He wasn't anything like that. His bodily presence was weak. And his speech contemptible in the eyes of many people. Apart from this present description, it seems he must have had a funny sort of twang in his voice or something. It made it sound strange. Paul was super qualified to be used by God because he was weak. He was a nobody. There was nothing attractive about him except Christ in him. Christ in him was the attraction. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, he says, I almost rejoice, he says. I'm glad that that's so. I'll rather boast in my infirmities. The power of Christ may rest upon me. We actually find weakness in God's creation itself. And we see in creation the strength that's found in the weak things that God created. And he uses Foolish, weak things to sustain the life on the earth. The bee fertilizes food-producing trees and plants. And without bees, there'd be no life on earth. Trillions and trillions of spiders keep insects under control. Otherwise, we'd be up to our neck in insects if it wasn't for the spiders. and There'd be no life on earth. You are, on average, <clears throat> never more than 10 feet away from a spider, ever, in your life. The earth contains an average of 1 million spiders per acre of land. And while I was preparing this last night, a spider came up, ran across my desk and went down the other side, as if to say, you see, it's all true. <clears throat> and simply put, Countless trillions of leaves on trees all around the world 
Breathe in the bad air and breathe out the good air, to put it simply. Cleansing the world's air. Every single leaf is a factory which has never been able to be duplicated in the laboratory, no matter how hard the scientists try. God uses weak things in his creation to fulfill his purposes. And our human weaknesses as Christians, as the vehicle for his strength and glory to be dis displayed. But the human and world sinful, unbelieving weaknesses are quite another story. Absolute stupidity to be trying to use them in any way at all. The world's wisdom, as we know, can't prevent the beginning of wars, can't stop them. The world's legal systems can't repair broken marriages or give justice to aggrieved parties or prevent crime. The world's leaders and politicians can't act to stop crime or prevent violence. Various political systems have never been able to solve the real needs of the world's people. And leaders still believe that they can make historically failed systems work. They're given another chance in their generation. We're seeing it in our day, aren't we? Just happening the same thing again. So do you feel weak, unqualified, useless, insignificant? Lacking imagination, intellectually challenged, out of your depth. All these are very special qualifications. Yes, they're qualifications. They're not hindrances in the purpose of God. You may feel that you've got all these disadvantages, all these weaknesses, or more of them. Then you are perfectly qualified to be a fruitful, high-functioning, Christ-honouring servant of the Lord. The more you feel unsuited, unqualified, weak and insignificant, the more room for God to work, the more room for the Holy Spirit to show Christ in your life, the more you should be a fruitful Christian. God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Hebrews 11 verse 34 tells us that many of the heroes of the faith, by faith, out of weakness were made strong. But of course, it's important that Christ is in you. Otherwise, it's a fleshly exercise that will never succeed. Your weaknesses will remain weaknesses. Christ must be in you. You must be born again. You must have the Spirit of God living within you, having changed your life and forgiven all your sins. And if that's not so, the Bible tells us you're not even a Christian. So to start trying to make Weaknesses into strengths will be fruitless and purposeless. These principles just won't work. Christ in you is the beginning point for weaknesses to be the place where God glorifies himself in your life. <laughs> Let's look at weaknesses in Bible characters. Abraham was a nobody, a nobody shepherd in Mesopotamia who wandered landless through the Middle East and became the father of us all, the father of the faithful, with children metaphorically in number like the sand of the sea, like the stars of the heavens. Joseph started out, started out as a nobody, a slave, a prisoner, lost and deserted by his brothers, and he became God's ruler over Egypt. Moses was a high-flying Egyptian who had to be brought down to be humbled in the desert as a shepherd so as to qualify for the divine calling. When he was called, he said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Please, Lord, I've never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. 
So he spoke the truth about his lack of qualification. But these were the very qualifications that God required for Moses to do the job that God was calling him to. All the judges through the book of Judges, think of them. Othniel, Jephthah, Ibsan, Elon, Abdon, all unknown warriors. Yet how important in God's work. We've seen the story there of David and his weaponry with Goliath. How weak David was, really, humanly speaking. We saw the dramatic presentation. In his weakness, he was made strong because he trusted in God. When he became king, David said these words, I am this day weak, though anointed king. What am I, Lord God, he said. Who am I? Weak and a nobody. Barzillai was a nobody. Yet what an important Bible character. Jabez. I wonder if you've ever heard of Jabez. What an example of prayer. True prayer was he. The men who hazarded their lives to get water from the well in Bethlehem for David. Do you know who they were? Who has ever heard of the lady, a harlot, a prostitute, who was Jesus' ancestress, was saved from death by the sign of the scarlet thread? All these were characters and places of no significance, but key characters and places in salvation history. Bethlehem itself was least important among the towns of Israel, the weakest of all the villages. The Exodus, another wonderful deliverance, as Israel in weakness and vulnerability faced total failure and annihilation. Esther was an unknown Jewish girl who saved the Jewish nation, preserved the line for the birth of Christ. Think of the people who built the wall under Nehemiah. The Bible tells us they were priests, goldsmiths, perfumers and women. Not one single builder amongst them, and yet they built the wall. Priests, goldsmiths, perfumers and women built God's wall around Jerusalem. When Zerubbabel started building the new temple, Zechariah asked the question, who has despised the day of small things? And he's already said that human efforts, big or small, are useless. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And moving to the New Testament again, the Lord Jesus Christ himself has only one genuine mention in the contemporary record outside the New Testament, in the annals of Tacitus, the Roman historian and senator, who mentions Pontius Pilate and the death of Jesus by crucifixion under Pilate's governorship. One genuine mention of Jesus outside the Bible. Just one tiny reference in ancient history of an event that shook the world and transformed countless lives of human beings and societies that embraced him. The apostles themselves were nobodies, ordinary people, fishermen, a tax collector, an urban terrorist was one of them. Sons of thunder were John and James, probably with hot tempers. Then less than the least of all the saints, by his own assessment, the greatest of all characters, Paul the Apostle, less than the least of all the saints, he said. Bodily presence weak, speech contemptible. Not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Here's what Paul says in another place in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world, the weak things, to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen 
the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. By faith, out of weakness, they were made strong. Hebrews 11, verse 34. The Christian life is the life of an unheralded, suffering soldier, often wounded, often experiencing apparent defeat. Paul said to the Thessalonians, not to be disturbed by their afflictions, for you yourself know that we've been destined for this. We kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 that harsh treatment and suffering is the purpose for which you've been called. Those who are to be betrayed by family and friends, the Lord said. He said he didn't come to bring peace but to bring a sword. Many are called but few are chosen. It's a narrow gate through which few people enter. Truth versus error. God versus the devil. Love versus hate. Kindness versus malice. Forgiveness versus revenge. And that means conflict and hurt and struggle and wounds and affliction and being misunderstood and spoken against. All this is summed up by the word weakness. Weakness as the qualification to be a servant of Christ. The Christian life is not outwardly attractive. Let's, let's face that, friends. It's not outwardly attractive. Paul spoke about a thorn in his flesh which kept him weak. That's what kept him weak and meant that the grace of God worked and God's grace was his sufficiency and the glory went to the Lord. The glory went to God. The identifying mark for us as Christian believers is weakness through which God's strength is made known. Surrender all to God and your awareness of weakness in this new year will become the very strength of God in your life. Weakness is the very special qualification for Christian servants, service, even to just truly live as a Christian. By faith, out of weakness, they were made strong. Faith links us to the cross, which was the weakest possible place for Christ and for God. But on the other side is the glorious resurrection of Christ in which we live, the life which we live. This is amazing, incredible truth, gospel truth. It is all true. And friends, we're not playing a game here. This is not a game. We're handling the things of God. We're dealing with eternal truth. We only have one chance. We'll never return for another chance. Not in all of eternity will we ever come back. We have to grasp this. And run like our very life depends on it, because it does. No more chances, just this one. And forever and ever and ever. Grasp it. Therefore, Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses. I glory in my weaknesses, he said. Now there is a hugely adventurous step to take in 2022 like no other. Amen, so let it be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this amazing gospel committed to us and your wonderful works, contrary to all the wisdom of men. You don't work like men, Lord. You just do not work like men. And everything is upside down. Please help us to understand these truths, to run with them in this year, to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, to accept our weaknesses as the very qualifications for living a godly Christ-like life. 
And so we pray, and so we commit one another to you. So we pray for the ongoing ministry from this pulpit and in this church over 2022, as we commit our whole lives to you, Lord, for time and eternity. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.